Hello and welcome to our ERCML details. In this series, we are going to discuss on five random evolved questions in a day. And we'll have a very different approach to each of these questions. So let's start our day one first question with a 23 years old woman uh, who has been brought to the emergency department uh, because of a chest wound. She was in her house during a severe thunderstorm when a large tree branch fell through a window and the window was shattered and large fragments of wood along with the glass struck directly into the patient. Until now, no any significant point has been mentioned. Uh, she did not lose consciousness, but her family found her bleeding profusely and rushed her to the hospital. Patient blood pressure is just 80 by 50 mmHg and pulse is 130 beats per minute. The patient appears to be in a severe distress. Under physical examination, it has been shown that there is a deep penetrating wound in the fourth intercostal space along the left sternal border. Small lacerations are noted across the face and forearms. So, question that has been asked is that which of the following structures is most likely to get injured in this patient? So, our approach will be like this. We will first uh, explore through every options and what conditions that other options can be correct and we will uh, enter into our proper answer. So, the first option is inferior vena cava. Inferior vena cava, it passes through the right side of the central tendon of the diaphragm along the 8th uh, thoracic vertebrae, that's TS le T8 level, and a penetrating wound to the back, not to the front. Please note it very seriously. A penetrating wound to the back of the patient. At the immediate right of the vertebral bodies could strike the IVC. So, whenever there is an stabbing injury from the back of the person so it can be either any fights or any uh, assault so uh, and that condition when there is a stabbing injury from the back uh, right immediately to the vertebral bodies then ivc is most likely to get injured so um, ivc is not an option here next option is left atrium uh, we know that the left atrium is located at the base of the heart, just uh, at the posterior surface of the heart, opposite to the apex, and it makes up the most of the posterior surface of the heart. So even under echocardiogram or even in the uh, cross-sectional imaging of the uh, thorax, uh, we can see the left atrium at the most posterior portion uh, in the imaging, and only the auricular face of the uh, left atrium is visible anteriorly protruding uh, between the pulmonary trunk and the left ventricle so left atrium is also least likely to get injured in this patient other option is the left ventricle uh, left ventricle it uh, composes the lateral most aspect of the heart uh, it composes the left lateral aspect of the heart and a stab wound angled slightly medially so please note it very seriously uh, for the left ventricle to get injured the stabbing uh, wound must be angled slightly medially so not a straight injury but the angled uh, uh, stabbing wound along the um, uh, fourth intercostal space that at the mid clavicular line please note it the line mid clavicular line fourth intercostal space angled slightly mid clavicular line affects the or uh, injures the left ventricle next pulmonary trunk so pulmonary trunk can be pierced uh, by a penetrating injury to the second intercostal space at the left sternal border so this uh intercostal space now marks is important right here so the uh in the steam question is it has been uh, mentioned that there is injury at the fourth intercostal space so in place of fourth intercostal space if second intercostal space has been mentioned then our answer will have been pulmonary trunk but uh, fortunately or unfortunately pulmonary trunk is not answered here uh, next is the right ventricle so this is the only left option so of, of course this will be our right option so uh, right ventricle it composes most of the anterior surface of the heart so whenever there is a deep penetrating injury at the left external border in the fourth intercostal space uh, the wound uh, directly punctures the right ventricle so our correct option is right ventricle here so let's uh, 
uh, go into a little bit deeper on this uh, question so uh, there are, is a order of penetration of a uh, stabbing injury at the fourth intercostal space and it has been mentioned in evolved so uh, i just kept this order here so we can see the orders from the slide you can just pause the video and you can uh, uh, note uh, note down the order of penetration uh, so this is a uh, cross-sectional imaging, a uh, contrast uh, imaging of the uh, thoracic CT uh, taken from first aid uh, 2020 edition. So here in the picture we can see uh, a right ventricle here. All right. So right ventricle is making the most of the anterior portion of the heart. So whenever there is stabbing injury from the anterior most portion right ventricle is most likely to get injured and uh, I had just mentioned left atrium is at the posterior most portion of the heart so in between the left atrium and this is an aorta so in between th these two structures there is esophagus that's why transesophageal echocardiogram can be done sometimes to visualize the bacterial endocarditis so this can be one of the approach uh, to visualize the structures of the heart, transesophageal echocardiogram. So please remember, esophagus is sandwiched between two blurry structures, that is left atrium and aorta. All right, so next question, question number two. Here, a 51 years old woman comes to the office due to progressively worsening fatigue weight gain and constipation for past six months so of course from this uh unit uh from this steam we can analyze uh, we can understand that this is a classical case for the hypothyroidism this is a progressive hypothyroidism the patient has had difficulty performing daily activities due to fatigue and she has no significant medical history and takes no medications the patient has no drug allergies and does not use tobacco alcohol or any other illicit drugs Blood pressure is 110 by ATM MSG and pulse is 55 beats per minute. Physical examination shows mild and diffuse, please note down, diffused enlargement of the thyroid gland. Cardiopulmonary and abdominal examinations are normal. So, of course, from this uh, classical finding of progressively worsening fatigue, constipation, weight gain, this is having progressive symptoms of hypothyroidism and from this uh, uh, classical esteem of diffused enlargement of the thyroid gland so when the thyroid gland is diffusely enlarged we can uh, consider that this is the classical case of a chronic or lymphocytic or Hashimoto thyroiditis the question that has been asked is that biopsy of this patient thyroid is most likely to show which of the following findings so we'll now explore through the question so our question is to can be summarized is that a middle is male presenting with the Chief complaint of progressive hypothyroidism with a physical examination finding suggestive of Hashimoto thyroiditis, that is, diffuse enlargement of the thyroid gland. So, uh, the biopsy finding will be uh, what will be the biopsy finding? So, our first biopsy finding the first option is there is a branching papillae with a cell containing empty appearing nuclei. Please note down this empty appearing nuclei is a $5 word for orphan NEI nuclei or fun NEI nuclei so this uh, branching papillae uh, with the empty appearing nuclei that is uh, or fun NEI nuclei is uh, classically seen in case of papillary variant of thyroid carcinoma uh, and of course there will be the samoma birdies so uh, first aid explain is that uh, papa and mama adapted in orphan so it's like papillary carcinoma presenting with shamama birdies and orphan in nuclei so this is not the uh, of course not the biopsy finding in case of the vinet question that is in case of uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis so branching papillary nuclei uh, branching papillary cells with empty appearing nuclei will be seen in case of papillary carcinoma of the thyroid gland so of course we know that shamama birdies is uh, not the pathognomic sign for the 
uh, papillary carcinoma only but there will be some amabodies present in case of like meningioma uh, will be there in case of uh, like prolactinoma can be there okay in case of serous mesothelioma there can be some amabodies so there are other conditions as well where we can see some amabodies but the presence of some amabody in case of thyroid carcinoma always suspect uh, papillary variant of thyroid carcinoma option b it has been mentioned that there is a there can be dense fibrous tissue extending beyond the uh, thyroid capsule so this is the classical uh, presentation in case of radial thyroiditis so radial thyroiditis is that uh, uh, pathoma states that radial thyroiditis uh, presents as a rock wood like a rock hard thyroid gland uh, so of course uh, like we can imagine uh, like thyroid gland is the uh, one of the most vascular organ of our body and this most vascular organ is presenting with uh, uh, the fibrosis so of course it will lose its vascularity uh, so uh, in case of radial thyroiditis there can be extensive fibrosis of the thyroid uh, gland and this extensive fibrosis sometimes extend beyond the capsule of the thyroid gland so uh, how will the person present when this uh, fibrosis uh, gets uh, extended beyond the thyroid capsule so uh, whenever the uh, fibrosis extends beyond the thyroid capsule the patient uh, might present with the dyspnea or uh, dysphagia uh, because of uh, effects uh, because it of uh, because it affects the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve and other uh, uh, laryngeal knobs that's why uh, the, there will be other signs as well so uh, of course, uh, dense fibrous tissue won't be uh, present in case of Hashimoto thyroiditis. Option C states there will be follicular hyperplasia with tall cells projecting into the follicular lumen. So I just want to make it like this. Suppose this is a follicular epithelium, then uh, it will be like that. Uh, there will be uh, 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 like the tall cells is projecting into the follicular lumen so it's like this there is the formation of scalloping like structure so uh pathoma mentions it's like scalloping like a structure uh that can be seen in case of graves disease uh, where the patient presents with diffusely enlarged thyroid gland associated with hyperthyroidism so uh, not pre associated with the hypothyroidism so if there is diffuse enlargement of the thyroid gland and the patient is hyperthyroidic in nature then uh, this can be one of this can be our option but the patient is of course hypothyroidic uh, and um, so uh, there won't be follicular hyperplasia and there won't be any scalloping of the colloid and other signs of uh, the Graves disease include uh, like there will be exothalamus there will be a uh, peritibial myxedema uh, so uh, why there will be scalloping of colloid is that because of the hyperactive reabsorption of the uh, co colloid and higher the around the edges of the epithelium uh, so uh, uh, the follicular hyperplasia can be seen in case of the tall cell variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma typically presenting in the older adult uh, says in enlarging thyroid mass our option D is there can be intense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate with active germinal centers. So, of course, this is our options because uh, in case of Hashimoto thyroiditis, uh, there will be the intense lymphocytic infiltrate and uh, sometimes these lymphocytic infiltrate option often uh, and sometimes these lymphocytic infiltrates uh, often presents with germinal centers and residual follicles can be surrounded with the herther cells and herther cells are the large oxyphilic cells filled with granulocytoplasm so of course this is our option and option e is like that there will be widespread inflammatory infiltrate giant cells and disrupted follicles so this can be seen in case of uh, decoervine thyroiditis that is subacute granulomatous thyroiditis so uh, decoervine thyroiditis is characterized by the uh, the follicles gets disrupted and there will be the uh, mixed cellular infiltrate sometimes there can be uh, the formation of multinucleated giant cells and uh, before decorvin thyroiditis the patient uh, classically presents with a uh, viral upper respiratory tract infection with fever and painful and tender thyroid gland so whenever in your uh, uh, vinit if there is the presentation of painful thyroid gland always always suspect decoid vein thyroiditis so first aid mentioned like 
Quervain, V A I N, pain, P A I N, D Quervain presents with painful thyroiditis. So, our option is intense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate with active germinal center. Here in the picture, we can see some of my bodies, which is a $5 word for uh, the concentric calcification. And here we can see orphan NEI nuclei, so which is almost empty appearing nuclei. And the nuclei gets uh, pushed to the periphery. All right. So, some additional point on Hashimoto thyroiditis. So, as with other forms of primary hypo thyroidism uh, there will be a low level of uh, serum thyroxine level and increased level of elevated TSH as a, a result of feedback mechanism and elevated antithyroid peroxidase antibody level confirms the diagnosis of Hashimoto thyroiditis and if the diagnosis gets uncertain like uh, in case of thyroid nodularity a biopsy can be done to rule out malignancy and the characteristic features or findings of the Hashimoto thyroiditis includes the there will be intense mononuclear infiltration so uh, there will be of course lymphocytic and plasma cells infiltration with germinal centers and the follicles the residual follicles uh, gets surrounded by the heart cells which are the large oxophilic cells filled with germinal centers which represents the follicular epithelial cells that have gone uh, metaplastic changes in response to the inflammation so our third question for the day it's a 26 year old man comes to the oncology clinic for a follow-up visit and uh, he was recently diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma just four months back and he is uh, currently receiving combination chemotherapy for Hodgkin's lymphoma and he has non-productive cough and shortness of breath with exertion over the past two weeks on examination there is no jugular venous distension or the pedal edema heart sound are normal with no murmur and long auscultation reveals bilateral fine inspiratory crackles and chest radiograph shows the bilateral reticular interstitial opacities pulmonary function test shows restrictive pattern of decreased diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide and chest x-ray and pulmonary functions testing prior to the initiation of chemotherapy were normal so i uh, will summarize this question just uh in, a, in our next slide so what question has been asked that which of the following uh, is the most likely mechanism of action of the medication causing the patient current symptoms so this is a question from pharmacology so the question has been asked uh, in such a way that we first need to know the drug of choice for Hodgkin's lymphoma and we need to know the mechanism of action of that particular drug so we can sum up our question like this a young person with recently di diagnosed Hodgkin's lymphoma receiving a combination chemotherapy develops a restrictive type of lungs disease with diffusion capacity with uh, a decreased diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide and chest x-ray and pulmonary functions prior to the initiation of chemotherapy were normal so of course we can get some of our uh, hint uh, right here so uh, the uh, uh, the drug is causing uh, the symptoms of uh, the, the drug is exa exaggerating the uh, pulmonary fibrosis so we need to know uh, the drug of choice for Hoskins lymphoma and that particular drug causing uh, the pulmonary fibrosis so of course the drug uh, like uh, there are certain drugs like uh, you know, bushel fan can be there bleomycin can be there to cause pulmonary fibrosis and for Hoskins lymphoma we choose bleomycin and uh, the mechanism action of bleomycin is that uh, it uh, induces free radical formation and the, uh, uh, with the help of oxygen and iron and it uh, breaks the DNA strand and so that the uh, neoplastic cells cannot uh, 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 like uh, it, it cannot multiply uh, so forth so our option will be option c but let's uh, dive uh, uh, through other options as well so uh, under option a it has been mentioned that there is uh, there can be disruption of microtubule polymerization causing m phase arrest so uh, uh, the drug causing the microtubule polymerization that's disrupting the microtubule polymerization is the vin alkaloids like uh, vin blast vin blastin vin christin are the certain drugs which uh, can uh, disrupt the polymerization of microtubule and by binding with the beta tubulin uh, and uh, it prevents the mitotic cell division so uh, this is uh, the drug uh, particular specific for the m phase and one of the like uh, uh, adverse drug reaction of uh, benkan calloid is the peripheral neuropathy 
Option B is uh, for the impairment of DNA synthesis by inhibiting thymidylate synthase. So uh, the drug of choice uh, is uh, the 5 uh, the, uh, 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 uh which inhibits the thymidylate synthase to impair the DNA synthesis. And uh, this 5 uh, fluorouracil uh, can uh, most likely cause bone marrow suppression because it's uh, impairing the DNA synthesis as well. That's why there will be uh, uh, all the event where there is the uh, maximum utilization of the DNA and its content where there is uh, the central dogma gets affected that's why there will be bone marrow suppression option c is induces free radical formation and dna strand break of course this is our answer so bleomycin is commonly used in the treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma and germ cell tumors and uh, which exerts anti-neoplastic effect by binding with the iron and oxygen molecules to create the free radicals uh, that causes dna strand break Option D is uh, the drug which inhibits the topoisomerase 2 leading to DNA strand break. Uh, so, uh, like drugs like uh, etoposide uh, can be used uh, to uh, inhibit the topoisomerase 2. So, of course, topoisomerase are the uh, molecules which uh, uh, helps to uncoil uh, or which prevents the supercoiling of DNA uh, during the process of uh, transcription phase so of course uh, it will again affect the DNA that's why uh, it will lead to bone marrow suppression and certain drugs like uh, anthracyclines like uh, doxorovision downorovision they also exert uh, the antineoplastic effect by uh, inhibiting the topoisomerase 2 and uh, like uh, one of the uh, commonest and, and most tested uh, airbus drug reaction of doxorovision is it can cause cardiotoxicity and uh, it causes uh, like uh, myocardial necrosis and the myocardial necrosis which is uh, caused by doxorovision is permanent uh, damage to the heart so uh, this uh, cardiac toxicity caused by doxorovision is not a reversible state uh, okay, this is for the which works by inhibiting the topoisomerase 2 and of, of course again it causes the uh, DNA strand breaking. Option E is inhibition of the tyrosine kinase and cellular replication. So uh, tyrosine kinase is inhibited by the drugs like imatinib, uh, desatinib, nilotinib, irlotinib and the imatinib drug is particularly used for treating uh, uh, CML, it's chronic myeloid uh, leukemia and irlotinib is used for the treatment of lung cancers and these drugs disrupt the cellular replication and commonly cause diarrhea and skin rashes. And option E is uh, it produces cell cycle errors to uh, apoptosis by inhibiting proteasomes. So the drugs like uh, uh, botezomib, uh, they can be used in the treatment of multiple myeloma. Uh, they causes cell cycle errors uh, and uh, inhibit proteasomes. So again, they cause uh, the uh, they can cause bone marrow suppression. So of course our answer is uh, induces free radical formation and DNA strand breaks uh, by bleomycin uh, leading to uh, pulmonary fibrosis and the patient presents with the uh, uh, restrictive type of lung stem is with decreased diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. So whenever there is uh, recently uh, uh, diagnosed pulmonary fibrosis or recently diagnosed restrictive type of lung disease in response to bleomycin treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma always suspect uh, for uh, the uh, bleomycin and the mechanism of action uh, can be uh, uh, like uh, the free radical formation and uh, breaking of the DNA strand so here I have summarized uh, some of the uh, antineoplastic drugs from first aid. Uh, bleomycin it uh, causes the uh, free radical formation uh, and it damages the DNA strand, hence uh, the uh, cell cycle cannot proceed ahead of drug. So question number four. Here, a neonate born to a 26-year-old woman is evaluated in a newborn nursery and the neonate was delivered vaginally at 30th week of gestation. Uh, EPGR scores were 8 and 9 at uh, 1 and 5 minutes respectively and physical examination shows hydrocephalus, jundice and hepatitis splenomegaly. Fundoscopic examination reveals retinal exudates. Uh, of course, this is a case for retinitis and scarring. Histopathological evaluation for the placenta shows the infiltration of lymphocytes, plasma cells, and macrophages. And there are numerous intracellular crescentric sept organism with a central nucleus. So this crescentric um, uh, sept organisms is a very uh, like uh, is a giveaway point uh, for the toxoplasmosis. And so which of the following uh, would have been most effective in preventing this past and current conditions so we'll explore through the options right here 
So, in case of uh, adequate uh, maternal uh, preconception immunization, uh, so uh, like uh, uh, sometimes the rubella vaccination for MMR, that's measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines, it can present congenital rubella infection, which is often characterized by the growth restrictions, hearing loss, uh, cloudy cornea, and meningitis encephalitis. And retinal lesions and hydrocephalus are uncommon, uh, which has been seen in case of uh, this patient, uh, in case of this uh, neonate. And the rubella is a virus uh, and it's not a Christian sept. So, of course, Christian sept is a very uh, giveaway point in case of this question. And uh, next uh, option is that avoidance of undercooked meat uh, consumption. So, of course, this is our answer because uh, uh, the congenital toxoplasmosis uh, uh, is transmitted to the uh, child from the pregnant mother uh, by the consumption of uh, the meat uh, which are undercooked and, the con and which contain the uh, oocyst, especially the tachyzoid stage of the toxoplasma uh, gundai so uh, it is due to the undercooked contaminated meat uh, so that must be avoided by the uh, pregnant mother so in uh, in case there is congenital toxoplasmosis the child presents with a triad of uh, uh, chorioretinitis hydrocephalus and there will be intracranial uh, calcification so in our next slide i will show you the intracranial classif uh, calcifications uh, which will be like uh, ring enhancing lesions uh, uh, in the sit scan and there will be uh, uh, under the uh, biopsy examination the tachyzoids will be crescent except so of course this is our answer uh, option c is consumption of pasteurized milk products so uh, pregnant mothers are advised to avoid unpasteurized milk products uh, to pre prevent listeria monocytogenes infections so spread uh, to the fetus can lead to the fetal death or abscess in the multiple organs and listeria is associated with the chorio immunitis uh, but is marked by the presence of gram positive rod uh, that exhibits the tumbling mortality so uh, please note the tumbling mortality for listeria monocytogenes is a very high yield point and uh, of course they aren't crescent except and uh, option d is that uh, sometimes uh, strict avoidance of mosquitoes bite during pregnancy can also prevent the patient's current condition but uh, this is not our answer because uh, uh, so let's say uh, the zika virus which is a flabby virus is transmitted by the mosquito and infections in the pregnant mother can lead to transplantation uh, uh, transplacental spread of the virus to the fetal brain causing microcephaly ocular deficits hearing loss growth restrictions and intracellular crescent to accept organisms will not be visualized of course in case of zika virus and uh, use a prophylactic penicillin during labor so we use uh, a prophylactic penicillin during the course of labor uh, to prevent uh, the gbs that is group b streptococcus uh, which uh, gets transmitted to the fetus during delivery uh, so during the 35th week of the gestation uh, we make a culture for gbfs that is uh, group b streptococcus and if, in case the culture is positive for gbs uh, we prophylactically uh, uh, inject uh, uh, the penicillin during labor so that there won't be uh, transmission of GBS uh, uh, during the uh, course of uh, birth so that there won't be uh, the uh, signs of neonatal sepsis and there won't be like meningitis won't be there so uh, uh, the signs of neonatal sepsis, sepsis includes the lethargy, hypoxia, temperature instability, hypotension so uh, they can be uh, the classical presentation when the uh, mother is positive uh, for gram uh, uh, for the uh, uh, group B streptococcus, and in case the prophylactic uh, uh, penicillin has not been uh, supplemented, so uh, we, we use prophylactic penicillin during labor uh, just to prevent uh, the transmission of uh, the group B streptococcus from the mother to the fetus, uh, and to prevent the early neonatal sepsis. So uh, GBS, of course, is a gram positive diplococcus. So our answer is uh, we need to avoid uh, undercooked meat consumption. So further explanation I have already mentioned about the classical triad for uh, congenital toxoplasmosis. Um, so this is chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus and intracranial calcifications under a CT scan and these calcifications will be ring enhancing in lesion so therefore the pregnant women are advised uh, to avoid the raw and undercooked meat uh, to avoid uh, in order to reduce the risk of infection and also uh, all those incidental injection like uh, sometimes from the cat feces oocytes from the cat feces uh, might also be one of the uh, uh, source of infection that's why uh, pregnant uh, pregnant mother is advised uh, to keep a distance from the cats and sometimes uh, of course undercooked meat can be one of the source of infection so this must be uh, 
uh, eliminated uh, they, they must be kept in distance so i have kept these two pictures from first aid in picture a we can see uh, the ring enhancing lesions uh, caused by the congenital toxoplasmosis and under uh, and in picture b we can see tachyzoite stage which are the christian trick shaped stages of the toxoplasma gondii so uh, these are the two giveaway point and is a very high yield point so our final question for the day it's uh question number five where a 45 years old woman is brought to the office due to polyuria and oxyuria and she has no fever uh, no dysuria no abdominal pain and the person has no significant medical problems and takes no medications her temperature is 36.7 degrees celsius blood pressure normal pulse uh, 76 per minute is again normal the passive mucous membrane appears to dry it means that uh, uh, she is uh, being severe dehydrated and water deprivation uh, for several hours uh, uh, causes no change in her urine output and osmolarity remains unchanged so uh, it means that uh, because of water deprivation we uh, uh, like uh, uh, we uh, knowingly uh, making the uh, serum uh, uh, hyper osmolar so that there will be the feedback mechanism uh, to the posterior hypothalamus especially to the uh, ovlt centers around hypothalamus uh, to cause uh, the release of adh so uh, if uh, the uh, posterior pituitary, if the posterior pituitary or the ovlt centers were responsive uh, to uh, the osmolarity of the serum of course there will have been the release of adh and the urine output would have been uh, maintained and osmolarity would uh, have uh, been uh, altered but uh, they aren't happening here but soon after the administration of desmopressin which is an ADH analog urine output decreases and urine osmolarity increases so uh, from this try uh, from this uh, unit we can uh, make our conclusion that she is having uh, central diabetes incipitus uh, it means that uh, her uh, ADS receptors which are V2 receptors around her uh, principal cells of the nephron are responsive to ADS but uh, there is no production of ADS from her uh, uh, like uh, from the uh, uh, like anterior or hypothalamus so this is the classical uh, condition for the uh, congen uh, for the central uh, diabetes incipitus the question that has been asked is that uh, renal clearance of which of the following substances will decrease the most after the patient's injection so after the injection of uh, adh sorry yeah so after the injection of the uh, desmopressin which is a, which is an adh analog uh, renal clearance of which of the following substances will uh, decrease them so the unit is like that they just want us to know the relation of adh and renal clearance of certain other substances so uh, they have presented us with uh, central diabetes incipitus just to uh, make us well oriented that in case of central diabetes incipitus there is no or uh, very low production of ADH uh, from her posterior hypothalamus so we can just summarize the question like a uh, person presents with central diabetes incipitus that is very low or no production of ADH and uh, which renal clearance of which of the following soft answers will decrease once we administer ADH to this uh, patient so option a for calcium so the majority of the filtered calcium is passively reabsorbed uh, from the proximal tubules and ascending limb of lupa finely through the paracellular root uh, because of positive uh, uh, voltage uh, uh, in the tubular fluid in the ascending limb of lupa finely uh, mainly because uh, of the sodium uh, potassium two chloride co-transporters and further calcium uh, reabsorption can be there from the uh, distal and the uh, collecting duct mainly stimulated by the parathyroid hormone and they are not uh, uh, affected by the vasopressin option b for creatinine so creatinine is freely filtered from the glomerulus and is a small amount is also secreted uh, by the proximal tubules and there would be no further secretion or reabsorption uh, occurs of the creatinine beyond the proximal tubules so creatinine uh, there won't be any change in the level of creatinine after administration of the adh to this patient uh, regarding glucose uh, of course the glucose is freely filtered and fully reabsorbed in the proximal tubules as long as the filtered load of the glucose is lower than the transport maximum 
and mainly uh, the sodium glucose co-transporter two receptors inhibitors act on the tubular receptors to lower the uh, transport maximum of the glucose and it can be used as a third line regimen for the type 2 dm so of course uh, some of these SGLT2 inhibitors can be used uh, in case of treating diabetes mellitus option d is para amino hyperic acid so PAH is filtered into the glomerulus and nearly completely secreted by the proximal tubule without significant tubular reabsorption. So PAH clearance depends on renal plasma flow. That's why PAH is, uh, can be used uh, to estimate the renal plasma flow. Unlike vasopressin, desmopressin selectively activates the uh, VT receptors and does not cause vasoconstriction which is mediated by the V1 receptors. And regarding urea so vasopro uh, the vasopressin uh, it uh, produces v2 receptor mediated increase in the water permeability within the cortical and medullary collecting duct and the arginine vasopressin activates the urea transporters in the medullary collecting duct increasing the urea reabsorption and decreasing urea clearance that's why the clearance of urea gets decreased once we administer uh, ADS analog uh, that's arginine vasopressin uh, to this patient who is having uh, central diabetes insipidus or who is uh, having very low in ADS so our option will be urea is the correct answer so with this we end up our uh, questions of uh, five out of five questions of you all so stay tuned thank you